Hi, everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to businesses to entire industries. Today, we have a very special guest coming back for his second appearance on the podcast, Justin Graham. For those of you who have not listened to the very first episode with Justin, I highly recommend it. Justin is a photographer, YouTuber, and videographer who lives in Hawaii and has worked on some really exciting projects, such as shooting for professional surfer Jamie O'Brien, Hollywood projects such as Jurassic World 2, Netflix's The Wrong Missy, Marvel's Inhumans, and more recently, Aquaman 2. Welcome back to the podcast, uh, Justin. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me. Round two. I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. Hey, happy uh, 30th. I don't mean to be creepy. I saw it on your uh, <laughs> vlog there and... Uh, I thought I'd wish you a happy uh, happy birthday. I know it's like the transition from 20s to 30s. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, it's a weird feeling because I remember when I was a kid, like I have memories of remembering like my dad turning 30, like specifically. <laughs> and it's just so weird to be that age that I remember like dad being that age. I don't know. It's a trip, man. You know, what's funny about it is that like when I was younger, I would look at those ages as feeling old like oh that's old like when you're 30 you're old or 40 you're old but then when you turn that age you don't feel old so you're like whatever (laughs) yeah you just kind (laughs) of run with it (laughs) yeah i don't feel any different so i hope it stays that way for as long as possible yeah so this uh this one kind of this podcast actually lands on the billabong pipe contest are you planning on heading over there to check it out tomorrow i think it starts tomorrow morning at nine or something right yeah i might the waves look really good but the problem is i have this new obsession with jet skis and toe and surfing and foiling and i have a crew of friends who all have jet skis who all do it so we just been having a ton of fun we all you know went through the classes together got the licenses and all that stuff and been collecting our gear and getting better so it's kind of hard, you know, I might go to pipe and, and watch the waves. I really enjoy that, but it's it's hard to watch the waves from the beach when you know you could be <laughs> out on the jet ski with the boys, you know? I know. Well, hey, what was that transition like? I'm just curious, like going from just regular, obviously, surfing, you know, to getting a jet ski and like getting comfortable, like being able to like go out there and learn how to like rescue and all that kind of stuff. Like you said, like your class, like classes, you had to go to like some sort of training on it or. That's actually a really good question because it's, it's pretty major. The, the skill level and the the hours that you need to put in. So just to give you an idea, we bought the ski. My dad bought the ski about uh, coming up on a year ago now. We've already put 160 hours on the engine, which is a lot. And most of those hours I was on the ski and, and being a part of like that day. So I'm definitely over a hundred hours now driving a ski in the ocean, wow. which is not where I need to be, you know, to be chasing bigger and bigger swell. But you know, it's, it's a good, a good step in the right direction, but yes, it's a transition. So anybody can drive a ski on a lake. It's yes. the easiest thing ever, right? It's glassy. There's no moving water. The only thing you have to worry about is other people and other boats. And of course, the shoreline and maybe some buoys or something. In the ocean, you add this whole element, right? The ocean is just doing its own thing and you have to react to what it's doing to keep yourself and your ski and your friends safe. And so it's it was really weird. When we first got the ski, I mean, I still fall off the ski from time to time because... Uh-huh you know, there's things just happen. That wave was a little steeper than you thought, or you went a little too fast around that corner, or you had three people on your ski and that changed the weight in the back. And now it's more tippy, you know? And so there's been a lot, lot to learn, but yes, in Hawaii specifically, there are very good rules in place for good reason. There is, there does need to be a transition with the rules, um, be, with the invention of foiling, but um, the local um, enforcers are a bit lenient when it comes to foils, right? Because they understand that the rules aren't really set up for it. But you have to have your jet ski license uh, okay. you know, to operate a ski anywhere in Hawaii. You have, we have um, maps for our ormas. So ormas are our recreational areas for thrill craft and there's a you know an interactive map that you can click on highlighted areas around the islands and it gives the regulation you can read the rules you can see where you need to be and where you can't be mm-hmm. and it's it's pretty crazy man like learning all of that and and you know 
with the expectation in the beginning of like, yeah, get a ski, go in the water, have fun. You know, it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah. You, get a you ski. kind of imagine that you could just buy a ski and, and just go out there if you really wanted to, but not, not so much. Right. I mean, you would get, you would get stopped probably if you try to do that. You get stopped if you're in the wrong area. And if you're trying to be in the waves and your ski isn't set up properly, they're going to spot that a mile away and come up to you and say, hey, you got, should you guys really be out here? I see you don't have any safety equipment on your ski. Do you even have licenses? You know, So the, the full gambit of it, you buy the ski, you got to outfit it with all the safety equipment. That means straps for the front compartment to keep it closed. Because if that opens up on a big wave, and you get water in there, your ski is probably going to go down. You got to have <laughs> straps over your seats to keep okay. your seats on. If you take a pounding, you're going through big whitewash, and your seat pops up, and you get water in the engine compartment. Your ski is going to go down. <laughs> you got to have a safety sled on the back with at least, you know, I think it's six or eight handles. You got to have a tow rope that's at least thirty feet long. You got to have a um, another tow line in the front of your ski that is short six feet or shorter you you know there's all these regulations and they're there for good reasons like that show that just came out recently i think on was it disney plus with or, or hbo or something but it's called the 100 foot wave with garrett mcnamara Did yes watch i watched that? the whole thing oh my god it was it was awesome yeah mental so garrett is like my really good friend that goes on the skis with us all the time he's friends with garrett and he he bought all his skis from garrett and garrett towed him in on the last the last swell. So we're really, you know, we're in proximity to this guy who is pioneering this sport of jet skis and surf at the same time, you know, he goes to Nazareth hunting that hundred foot wave. It's pretty crazy. So we're, it's really nice to be tied in with that kind of, of experience and talent and, um, and kind of translate that onto what we're doing. We're obviously not surfing waves like Garrett surfs, but for our own little world of this, you know, sport, it feels so cool to push yourself and do it with people who are committed to doing it safely. And, and I mean, we go practice on days that are completely flat. We practice safety pickups and picking up your friend and getting more efficient at it because that's what it takes. It just takes hours and hours and hours of doing that. Like it depends on what board you have too. If you have a tow board with straps, it's a different pickup than if you have a foil, if you have no board, and you're just, you know, you inflated your vest and you're getting pounded by the by the sets and your buddy comes in with the ski as fast as he can and whips the safety sled right at you. And you grab on, that's one way. Or your buddy can come by, lean off the side of the ski with your with you know the left hand, because the throttle's on the right. You gotta lock wrists and, and you gotta sling him back as you drive forward onto the sled, and you only have seconds before the next wave comes. Yeah. And so it's 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 for me, I love progression of new things and I take my time and I, I do my best to do my due diligence and learn from people and and not just go out there with, you know, oh, I'll be fine. You know, I like to just soak in all the information <laughs> from everybody and like, you know, really try to do it as safely as we can. I see. I get the feeling that everybody in that area knows one another. So like if for some reason I would never do this, but like I just showed up and I was like, hey, I'm backing in my ski and I'm about to take off. I get the feeling that you guys and probably a lot of other people would be like, who is that? And where is he going? Do you know what I mean? Is there kind of that kind of local kind of understanding where you kind of probably should connect with someone who's around the area that can help you and and guide you and that kind of stuff. Let's say if you just move there or if you're going to be there for a long period of time and you really want to get into toe surfing or something like that. Yeah. I mean, there is some of that. And I, and I mean that we've started to see, you know, there's a lot of toe teams on some days and, you know, every we're humans, we're predictable and, and people start to slide into their roles in the water, right? At pipe, you know, who those people are, who are going to be regulating that break, you know, Mm -hmm. And it's starting to get that vibe for me in the toe surfing world here, which I don't really like. You know, certain people want to regulate the spots. And, and, you know, if you if you break a little bit of etiquette with 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 your driving, you know, they'll let you know, which is good. I like that self-correcting part of safety. Uh But um, the sometimes the attitude isn't quite right. So if you were to come here 
buy a ski, you know, you're going to fork out the out tens of thousands of dollars and get your whole set up and you're going to do this. You got surf experience. You're going to go toe surfing and you show up to the dock. If your ski is set up properly and you've got proper safety equipment and, and we, and no one has a clue who you are, you're probably going to be fine. As yeah. long as you are following driving etiquette there, you know, you don't want to just wake out people's waves you want to keep your distance you know you got to stay a thousand feet from any paddle surfer you gotta you know yield to them you need to and you don't want to like film certain spots you know there's there's all kinds of stuff like that but the localism isn't nearly as bad in the ski world as it is at pipe or anything like that just because the entry to get into ski is like you gotta it's like 20 grand for a brand new ski you know what i mean it's yeah that's what i was gonna ask you like like what would it cost to do that like if you're just like okay i'm a really really good surfer i i, I now have some friends or something and we all decide we want to get into it kind of like i guess you and your dad decided to get into it like you're saying like around 20 grand to get a ski and then also have it outfitted or do you outfit it yourself or how does that work yeah so if you want the the creme de la creme jet ski like supercharged nice one it's about 20 grand um i'm not sure if that includes a trailer or not so you're looking 23 somewhere in that range it's like a car basically Mm, and then you to outfit it is about 3500 bucks for the material i think Mm -hmm. it's maybe a few hundred or something to have it installed for you but we opted to do it ourselves just because we wanted the project for fun okay and i wanted to film that and make it a cool you know progression of what we're doing so you can have it outfitted if you want so that's like four grand there so you're looking you know you're almost to 30 grand just sub 30 grand and then you know you're gonna have to pay for the classes which aren't that expensive a few hundred bucks i think but and then you know you need you need a wetsuit you need a float suit you need you need an inflated vest an inflated vest is like 1200 bucks and then the wetsuit's like 350 or 250 or something and then um, what else? You need a board. You know, if you're doing a toe surfboard, you can get one for 550 bucks, 600 bucks if you find kind of a used one or like a certain style of new one. And if you want a foil, you know, that's <laughs> like three, four grand for foil stuff. It's like pretty ridiculous. Um, and, and you need the garage to store all this stuff. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you got to keep it safe and out of the sun. Yeah, when you're not using it. So it's the the barrier to entry is pretty high, and I feel very fortunate to be in the position and and have the opportunity to do it. And I try to share it with as many of my friends as I can. And, and yeah, it's, it's really cool, but that also keeps the crowds low, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the barrier to entry is so high that, you know, the only people going out there are probably the ones that are either just getting started or really know what they're doing, you know, and you, you had mentioned your dad. So does your dad, you and your dad do this together? Like, did he teach you how to do this or how did that work? So he, he, it's so funny. He called me one day and he was just like, what do you think about a jet ski? And I was like, yes, a hundred percent. What do I think about a jet ski? Yes. Get one if we can. He's like, well, I just figure like, you know, cause I have a younger brother and he just finished his nursing school and he has to go to the mainland to get a couple years of experience before coming back. That's just how it works here. Okay. So he's, he's like, well, you know, your brother's about to leave and like, who knows how long you'll be around. I'm like, bro, this is my home. I'm going to stay here forever. So if you get the ski, I'll, <laughs> I'll play with you like for years and years. He's like, okay, well let's get it. Like whatever, let's just send it. Cause you know, life, life short, let's just do it. I'm like, yeah, go for it, man. Like you might as well. So he goes to get the ski and then it just, the process started from there. We, we both knew zero about foiling. We both knew dang near zero about driving a ski in the ocean and we did as much research as we could and we just started going and we just learned together um i've since then you know gone with just joined this whole community of jet ski people and met so many people through it and it's just been awesome like i've been out on really big days and and i'm fortunate to not have like a full-time desk job or any of that so i get to go like all the time my dad you know, it's awesome and he works really hard. So he's normally free just on the weekends. Mm-hmm. So if a big yep. swell lines up, then he's on. And if it, if it doesn't, then we go foil smaller waves. So yeah, it's been awesome. So has this also been kind of a tool for you when it comes to filming? Meaning like if even if you're not going to surf, you're now learning how to 
how to film from the craft itself so that you can take shots from, you know, the ocean to the island or surfers on big waves and things like that. Has it like expanded your capabilities? Dude, it's pretty much changed my life. And I've told so many people that exact sentence. I'm like, dude, the jet ski, I love the jet ski. It changed my life. Like it changed the island for me. It changed everything. Recently, uh, as you know, I do high-end drone work stuff, commercial drone work stuff. And we were working on a production with an amputee um, his name's Albert. He he's a Nat Geo explorer, and he had that that show. I was like ancient, ancient uh, civilizations, or or something yep. like that. And he he came to Hawaii, and his whole thing was okay. So he got in this accident. I don't remember what the accident was. He has to get his his leg amputated, but he's in the hospital bed. It's still connected, and they're like, yeah, like we could try and save it, but you know the chances of that are pretty low. Or we could, you know, cut it off for, you know, it's pretty gnarly. And he's like, oh, like half a leg, like basically cut off at the knee. Okay. Um, and he's like thinking about it. You know, he has to make a decision for himself. They're not just going to do whatever unless it's, you know, life threatening. And so he finds this guy. Let me figure out his name. What was his name? I really want to get his name in here because it's really important. Like it's, it's a good name. He's like unfindable on the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it, come, if, it come, if it pops into your head, which I'm sure it will, uh, we'll yeah. definitely circle back in it. So, so you were saying, so he he connected with this person, and then and then they so, kind of helped guide him, or yeah. So Albert's on the hospital bed. He's about to, he's trying to figure out if he's going to get amputeed. He finds this guy on the internet who's also amputee, but he surfs. And Albert goes, "Dude, if this guy can surf without a leg, I'm going to be fine. Let's cut the thing off." Cut it off. Oh. Boom. He goes on this journey to learn to surf and eventually get barreled with and and prosthetic. Right. Oh so he, anyways, that's the production that's coming to Hawaii. They come out here. They're like, yo, can you guys do some drone shots? Yes, for sure. Let's do it. And we meet these guys. These are the coolest guys ever. And um, we, you know, and this brings it back to the ski. Like me and Kella, the guy that I do drone work with, we both have skis. And one day they were like, well, where can we go to get these shots? You know, it's crowded everywhere. And we're like, hey. We got skis, we got smaller drones, like we could fly a drone from the ski, we could take you guys out with your cameras, and and they're like, really, would that really work? We're like, yeah, for sure. And we were so stoked, because we're like, we're, we're going to make money with our jet skis, that's so cool, <laughs> this is awesome. And so we took our jet skis out, and I got a guy on the back of mine with a red, like in a plastic bag, and fortunately, you know, I had all these hours of driving, and I was able to keep him and the camera from getting wet. And get these awesome shots of Dude, that's of awesome. So I was like, this is so cool, man. I love jet skis. It's awesome. And yeah, filming filming for my videos, it's been awesome. Um, learning to fish, too, off the back of it. And there's just so many options for, for making videos with the skis. So one of the things I was going to tell you that I absolutely loved about your videos was the ones where you go fishing on your jet ski. And yeah. one of the reasons, I've never seen that before. So I, you know, I watch a lot of Hawaii kind of, um, either nature surfing or whatever kind of videos and stuff like that on YouTube and other places. I've never seen anyone fish, catch fish and store them on their jet ski before. And I even (laughs) pulled my wife in. I was like, dude, you got to check this out. This is amazing. This is like, cause I fish as well. I, I love fishing. And so I was like, this is the way to do it. And I was like, look at this. And I, I thought that looks so fun. Is it, su- is it super fun? Oh my gosh, it's so fun. Like, so I'll, there's a lot going on here with this fishing video and this whole concept. More probably than you're expecting. I have always wanted to learn to fish. That's one thing. We got a jet ski and Kella fishes off a ski all the time. And I was like, let's learn this, you know, and I would love, I just eat. As a guy, you know, you kind of feel like a hammer. You know, you go catch a fish, you bring it back, and you, you cut it up, and then your girlfriend, like, cooks it, and you eat it together, and you're like, yeah, I'm the man. You know, it's like kind of like <laughs> a little bit like primal instinct kind of thing going on, but um, that's another element. But then the, another element is that surfing and ocean sports in general, like, against mm-hmm. everything else on the Internet, is not viral. At all. Interesting. Like you to get views in this space is the hardest thing. I mean, think about this. The biggest one of the top YouTube channels in the world is gaming. Yep. Right. At a hundred plus million subscribers. The biggest top 
biggest channels in surfing are WSL and Jamie O'Brien, and they're like 800,000 subscribers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, it's literally a hundred times smaller than gaming. And yeah. so it's like, whoa, you know, when you realize that, you're like, okay, this is the uphill battle we're against as, as like me, right? Almost 10,000 subscribers in, if you were to compare the ratio, like that's kind of a lot. But yeah, no, I, I mean, I saw that and I was like, wow, he's doing pretty good in that, in that segment because the reality is, is, is that until Jamie started doing his stuff, really the only whispers I heard among our community, you know, and I surf out here, not as good as you just so you know, but I do surf out here, um, is that, uh, is, is WSL, right? It's just yep. like, that's your source for getting any cool videos. Um, and then after Jamie started, you started doing uh, the work with Jamie, suddenly I started seeing like, I think it was Koa Rothman and like others started creating yep. channels. And now I'm starting to see a lift in general, like where yep. people that I know, are like, oh, did you check out so-and-so's channel like when he surfed pipe yesterday and stuff? And I was like, what? Like, it's really starting to just pick up right now, it seems like to me. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. That's, I mean, surfing is a great sport and I'm glad everybody's getting eyes on and hopefully gets, you know, the itch to get out there and learn or go more. That's yeah, awesome. so a question about um, the drone stuff on the water. So. In a situation like that, where you're taking the jet ski out into the water and you have your drone with you, are you going to try to do that alone? Or do you actually need a, a drone operator and then a driver? Or can a driver also fly a drone safely out in the water like that? Yeah. So yesterday or the day before yesterday when we went, uh, we you, you need a driver for the ski. You need someone to ride a board and then you need a filmer. Okay. Whether that filmer is in the water or on the beach flying the drone or on another jet ski out the back where it's more smooth water flying from there. Depends on the drone operator's uh, skill level. So it's, it's quite an operation. Oh, but I just wanted to touch back on the fishing thing. I wanted to finish that thought. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, surfing in general is not viral, but fishing is. Mm, so, okay. like, if you were to compare surfing up against fishing or golfing or any of those things or gaming like it's it's still super small so like one of my favorite channels brody moss from australia he does fishing and he also rips at surfing by the way i've seen a couple clips of him um but i was you know everyone fishes throughout every all the countries across america everyone fishes whether it's the creek in the backyard or the lake so that's that's the full kind of thought around wanting to go fishing more. It's fun. It's awesome. You feel like a hammer and there's potentially more views. So anyway, that was that full thing. Well, I think there's nothing more like centering than you're like, oh, I got up in the morning. I went out in the water and it's like on a jet ski, you're lower too to the water, you're closer to the water. So you actually like feel the water, right? Compared to being in like yeah. a huge boat. And then you're catching a fish, pulling it out. You're having to handle it, get it prepared, bring it back. And then suddenly you're cooking it and eating it. And you're like, wow, that whole experience was controlled by me. You know what I mean? And now we're eating because of it. So like, that's, that's pretty awesome. And I think people do like to see that. And I like the way that you filmed it as well. Um, and I wanted to, to ask you about that. So in the moment, I mean, I fish, so I know when you're catching a fish, there's a lot going on in your mind. And you're, you're thinking about, okay, don't pull too hard, you know, let it run. You know, you're thinking about how am I going to get it out? Like, I'm going to have to like unhook it, put it inside of its, you know, container, whatever it is. And you're filming at the same time doing this, trying to get good footage. Um, what is your trick to kind of, I guess, piecing that experience together so the person who's watching it can really get an idea of what you had to do in order to catch the fish and get that fish onto the jet ski? but also have good, good footage. You know what I mean? That that's yeah. good quality rather than just bouncing around all the time and, sh and, and shaky cam, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So my, my kind of goal with, with any video, but especially a fishing video is to kind of just, I want people to, I don't want to pretend that I'm like some super good at whatever, especially fishing. So I want to make sure that I show that I know literally hardly anything. I'm going to be learning all this from Kella, you know, 
and and bring people along that so i want to start there okay then we get in the water okay awesome the key to filming on the jet ski is pretty much gopros okay. uh the i use i have two hero nines i haven't gotten the 10 yet i really want to but the hero nines are awesome i have one with the max mod lens it's like super wide angle okay and i have one with the regular lens um, for the fishing, I put the super wide angle on a, a mouth or a head mount. Okay. That way you've got this just like first person POV and I don't have to think about filming at that point. Okay. Okay. As soon as we start fishing, you know, I do my thing. I shoot putting the lures on and doing all that. But then when it really comes down to fishing, I just have it on my head. It's not even on, you know, and it's, I'm jigging, whatever, get a couple shots of jigging turn it back off. But as soon as there's a fish on, you hit record and then you just do your thing because you know that GoPro is like super wide angle and it's going to catch the action. Um, and then you just go for it. You just, just live your life at that point. Just get excited, okay. you know, do your thing. And that's, what's really cool. I, I, what I do want to do is like get a really tall pole for the jet ski that I can put a camera up high looking down. And that way okay. you can see the whole, the water and the fish coming up and us on the jet ski. And I think that would be a really cool angle, but kind of more hands off, the better in a, in a tippy boat situation. So do you, do you also drone as well? Like trying to get like the view from above of like where you guys are at or anything like that? Yeah, sometimes I do. And with, with my drone, I have the DJI Air S2. It has a follow you feature as long as you turn on all the sensors you can kind of highlight an item in the screen and it will track that. So you oh, can, wait. um, is that what you guys did then for surfing and stuff? Is that you would not actually... for surfing because oh. it's too high speed. Okay, okay. You have to do that manually, but with, you know, a jet ski or, or a boat where I need to be driving the craft, uh -huh. that's a great feature. You just fly it up high, you know, lock it onto the, the easy contrast, yellow and black jet ski on a blue ocean. It's easy track. And it'll just follow mm. you. Okay. So I, I have a question about that too, about the drone. So around here, for example, pretty much everywhere you go has a sign that says no drones. Mm -hmm. like, like they've been, either you have to have like a license or you have to um, check with park services in advance. It's becoming more difficult to like film stuff just because it seems like everywhere has kind of put a, a no drone on it. What's, what's Hawaii's policy like? because it seems like there's more and more people are using them there now on drones out in the water, drones on land, like all that cool footage you guys do. Like, do they not care as much or do you have to have a license or how does that work? Well, as far as I know, and maybe this is the most updated information, if you're flying a drone that's under a certain weight, it's like what, 50 grams or something. I don't, uh -huh. I don't remember what it is. You're, you're pretty much okay as long as you're not doing it commercially, um, mm. you know, and I mean, technically I am doing it commercially. I guess I make a few dollars off YouTube videos, but you know, that's an easy argument. Um, mm. And that is like the drone that I have now is so advanced. It has a map on it of all the air spaces. And if I need to access one of those air spaces, I can, you know, apply for that um, on DJI's website and get access to that. Whoa. You know, I can, uh, as long as you follow the rules, you know, you need to stay below 400 feet AGL, which is above ground level. Um, so you can fly, you know, we have mountains here that are whatever, 3000, 4,000 feet high. I can fly up there as long as I'm within, I think 150 feet of that cliff. Mm, so okay. in other words, you know, they're trying to, if you're going to be up high with your craft, be close to the land because the helicopters and the planes aren't going to be close to the land. I see. Okay. And so, you know, there are restricted zones that I, the drone won't even take off because it's directly in, in a flight path of an airport or, or things like that. And so that's automated. Mm -hmm. And then um, with this new drone, I'm mind blown. It has this, uh, it, it communicates with the other crafts in the air. So if a helicopter is approaching, it gives me a warning. And on the map, I can see its flight path. It, okay here comes the helicopter or a plane and it's like you know it warns you before it even gets to you you know fly at a safe level take you know move out of the way or whatever you need to do 
and it, it tells you where all the crafts are. So it's it's so much safer than it used to be. I can't even explain. And with all the sensors on the drone too, yeah. I have never once ran into a drone issue as far as like with the FAA or with some kind of regulatory body. I, I've never had a problem. Yeah, because you know, I see when I see you guys filming uh, waves and surfers and things like that. Sometimes I'll see multiple drones like flying out there. Obviously, because there's different people filming and stuff. They don't like you. They don't collide. You don't have any issues with that kind of stuff. Like from a technical standpoint, it, you pretty much know how to like stay away from one another. So there have been a couple of instances where drones <laughs> fly too close to the waves and go in the wave. Okay. Uh, and sink. There have been drones that hit each other. There was one recently. Uh, and then we had almost an, an incident where I think it's a fire rescue helicopter lights, likes to buzz pipeline like at 100 feet. Whoa. You know, it like pretty... comes in so close. And we've always been kind of confused by that. Like, okay, what's going on? Are you looking for somebody? Are you going, are you showing off? You know, are you, I don't want to assume anything. Are you practicing? Yeah, is this a, a practice maneuver? Or why are you so low and only over pipeline where you know there's going to be drones? Mm. And so they, they've come really close to some drones before. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but I hope that um, it doesn't cause any incidents. And I hope that the drone pilots all have the, the new technology that lets them know the helicopter's coming. Exactly. Wow. So are you still, um, are you still shooting professional surfers or have you pulled away from that? Like where, where are you at with all that stuff right now? So after quitting working with Jamie, I, um, did some traveling and just did YouTube stuff and then, um, kind of came back to the Island and I started working at his surf school, um, at okay. Turtle Bay. I was taking photos and that was really fun for a while. And then I got this other guy, Parker, the job. And now he, you know, he does that and he films with me for the vlogs which okay. is really cool. So I met him through that process. Um, and now I just do, you know, freelance with the drone guys and, and I'm working on my YouTube and I'm actually just starting this idea of making a, a higher end show, like an episode series, maybe six, eight, ten episodes, but it's going to go on a new streaming service called Stream Moco. Have you heard of it? No, I haven't heard about that one. Tell yeah, me about it's it. super new Stream Moco. It's, it's really cool. So the subscription is four bucks a month. One of those dollars goes to the creator. If, if the person signed up through that creator's link. Okay. One of those dollars goes to a chari charity of the, the viewer's choice. There's a few charities to choose from. Wow. And then two of those dollars goes to the company. That's awesome. So it's really cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I like the concept and, and with my meetings with them, you know, there are some really big things going to be happening this year, 2022. And it kind of just sparked the idea for me that like, you know what, I should, I should hit up my, uh, my friends who are really good at filming and telling stories and put together a series. And I kind of want to base it around bringing people out of their comfort zone into one of my comfort zones, which is these adventure things, you know, whether it's repelling mm -hmm. a waterfall or going on the jet ski or scuba diving or whatever it is. And, um, yeah, just try and, and share experiences with people that they may not have had otherwise in their life. And I think it'd be really cool. That's awesome. So do you end up like pitching the idea to them and then shooting it, or would you go and shoot this whole experience and then come back to them and say, Hey, we finished this series and here it is. Um, we'd like to put it on the network. So they reached out a few months ago and wanted me to be one of their, you know, early creators before, before it launched. And I, you know, they're like, can you just send us some of your YouTube videos? Like maybe, you know, six of them or something. And, and, you know, if we need to edit them down a little bit, we will. And I was like, you know, what? why not? So I sent them some episodes, just just some of the YouTube videos I've already posted, yeah. just to kind of get my foot in the door and, and be a part of it, because I thought it would be really cool. And um, no idea on the analytics on that. I, I it's on it's on there to watch. But obviously, you know, anyone who's watched my YouTube videos, you don't need to pay and watch them again on a different service. But sure, yeah. what that did was get me in there. And, and the meetings since then have led to this, you know, okay, you know, Justin, what we want to be is kind of, you know, an in-between between YouTube 
and having your own television series. You know, there's a big gap in between there. Oh, yeah. So you can kind of go from YouTube, you go to Stream Moco, you do a higher end show. And through that networking process and that exposure, you can then potentially jump to the next thing or go 100% Stream Moco. You know, the revenue could support that. Yeah, because I mean, for something like your show that uh, you have on on YouTube, um, and then you know, so you have your YouTube show and you kind of control all of that, but then you see other networks like that one, or you see like the Red Bull Network or things like that. Um, do typically those shows get pitched for a single network, meaning like they want to exclusively own that particular show, or do you have like the rights to say, oh well? You know, a couple episodes are going to be on YouTube. A couple episodes are going to be on uh, Red Bull TV, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think with the the bigger, you know, more established networks, it's it's a very lengthy pitching process before you even film or sometimes after you film. It goes both ways. And those pitching processes are like insane, like such a process, many, many meetings. They have to look at their analytics and see what their audience is kind of looking at, what's trending. And if your show lines up with that, if it's going to be beneficial, you know, do they want to buy it or whatever. With Stream Moco, they want me to just make awesome, feel good, quality content. And they want it to just have a little bit deeper of a story than my YouTube channel. And I would send that to them and they would upload it onto their, their servers and stuff and have it available. They can do, you know, options they could do hey we can release one a week for you or you can release all of them or one a month whatever you want to do and they're they're kind of you know they're kind of like a big brother helping hand to kind of move you forward into your storytelling process you know it's like something to push you to be to do it better do it a deeper like side of each story and so there there it's not like a pitching thing it's none of that i can go and make whatever i want and I can send it to them and, and, you know, they'll most likely be stoked and put it on there. That's awesome. And it almost sounds like there's a lot more opportunity for creative people like yourself now to expand and, 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 and get your stuff out there. Right. It sounds like, you know, but not, yeah. it's not just YouTube, but now you have all these other channels and you have all these other opportunities and potential streams and things like that. Um, where you can get your content out. I, I am curious from like a promotional standpoint, like where do you feel like you get your biggest bang for your buck? You know, when it comes to promoting the stuff that you create. Title and thumbnail. <laughs> oh, title and thumbnail. Okay. Title and thumbnail are the most important thing. Um, and then, you know, you need click through rate for YouTube specifically. You need a click through rate of your thumbnail. So the the percentage of people that's with their eyeballs, they saw the thumbnail and the title and the percentage that clicked and YouTube tracks all of that. And if you can get like a 12 or 15 or higher percent click through rate, you're going to get some decent views. And then the next analytic is, did they watch all the way through the video or did they click away part way through? And that mm-hmm. audience retention is what um, helps you go viral. So if you get lots of clicks and people stay for the whole video, to guarantee viral but that is a hard combo to figure out what's the trick to keep them to watch to keep them watching the whole thing i've always wondered about that like you know most i would say most episodes of channels that i follow i tend to watch the whole thing um but there are times where you know you kind of go like okay this is going on and on and you walk away but as the creative what goes through your mind when you're thinking about i don't want people to just drop off after I catch the fish or after I jump into the waterfall or whatever thing that you're doing? You know, it's a constant internal battle with me because I started this whole thing, right? To just share cool stuff. Cause I love taking my friends to do fun things, but I was like, you know what? There's like billions of people in the world that may also like to watch this and live vicariously and then get it, you know, inspiration to go and do their own things in their hometowns. That was the whole premise behind this thing. But I struggle because it's like, okay, do I make content that people want to watch or do I make content that I like? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas sure with Mr. Part. Yeah, Mr. Beast, he looked at it. I mean, he spent the last decade making videos and he figured out he was like exactly 
what people will watch. Down to the length between cuts, the sound, the, the pacing, the, the words he uses. The, I, I heard a rumor that he pays 10K to have his thumbnails made. Wow. Okay. Each thumbnail, 10K. You know, photoshopped and made to just be super enticing and the titles and all that. So he knows and understands and he's done podcasts like this and explained some of that. Like it's so important to get those clicks. And if you don't, you're not going to go viral. And he has figured that out. But, you know, he's found content that he knows people are going to watch. I mean, I'm sure he enjoys making those videos, too. But for me, right, I'm not going to go and change directions and go do, you know, challenges for money or pranks or, or not, you know, it's just I, I know I have to stay true to what I like to do and what I like to share. And if that comes with the cost of not going viral, I'm pretty sure I'm OK with that. <laughs> yeah, you're staying pure to it, which which makes total sense, because like, you know, most of the people that I have talked to who, you know, either watch your channel, Jamie's channel, other people's channel. I asked them, I say, is it, is it just the surfing? Is it this and that? And they're like, no, it makes me feel like I'm there. And so it's like, it's like a moment in time where you get to go, okay, I'm here in Hawaii. Like even, um, Tina, uh, Tina Cohen's channel, right? It's like, she's cooking or she's walking down the street and grabbing a papaya or something. It's like, yeah, in your mind, you're like, I'm in Hawaii right now. I'm not sitting at my desk in Silicon Valley or whatever it is. Right. And I think that is so beautiful to kind of like pull somebody in for 30 minutes or 15 minutes and give them that, that experience. And I feel like you all do that in your own way. Do you, do you feel though, Justin, like your experience working with Jamie and the intensity of it? I think you guys were doing like two a week, right? At one point. Yeah. Do you feel like you learned something from that when it came to promotion and all that? Like, Cause you guys, I'm sure we're studying the numbers, like you mentioned last time and trying to figure out like what people liked and they didn't like, did you learn some kind of technical experiences from that, that you can apply to your own channel? For sure. For sure. We, we had a group chat, um, twice a week with potential thumbnails and titles and everyone would pitch in ideas and, and edit the photos differently. And, you know, it was a, it was a group process. I struggle a lot, um, with, you know, I hate doing things by myself and, you know, you know, Jackson and the whole Sickles crew, they're here, they're gone, they're here, they're gone. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, I'm like, I'm by myself, I'm not by myself, I'm by myself. <laughs> so, yeah. but what's really cool is I have a friend, uh, Gora, who I go jet ski a lot with, and he really wants to make a channel, and he's ordering all of his equipment to do it. You know, he's in a position where he does a lot of really cool stuff. I mean, he has a plane, he's got a hangar down at the airport, he's got jet skis, you know, he's a really cool guy and loves adventures. And I was like, dude, just make a YouTube channel. He's like, I'm going to do it. So That's there's, awesome. there's something cool there. Like that group aspect, that collaboration on the day to day when you're making videos is super important. And that was a big part of what we did working with Jamie. It was, you know, Jackson and I are up in his business, you know, every day filming his life and, yeah. and, 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 figuring out titles and thumbnails and how to edit better and, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah. And, and the more content you can put out the better and there's, but there's only so much you can do, right. You don't want to burn yourself out. You don't want to go, but you, you, you gotta be consistent. You gotta at least release one, at least one a week. And mm-hmm. sometimes I feel at that just cause I get too busy or whatever, but I try to release th- these next couple of weeks. I'm releasing two a week just cause I have extra um, footage and might as well. But yeah, yeah, I learned a ton from that experience. Yeah. I would imagine that every time you take on a project, you grow in some way from it. And I'm, I'm curious about some of these, uh, Hollywood projects that, that you've done. I think the most recent you mentioned when we were chatting was the Aquaman two. Um, you had yeah. a chance to work on that a little bit. How does that come together? That's what, that's what we got some questions after the last podcast, um, with you where people said like, I don't understand, like, how does it come together that they're going to film? And then suddenly you get to be part of that. Like what is the behind the scenes of how that comes together where you get to actually do some drone footage? Like we, our, our assumption was, is that they have a crew already and the, that crew just goes to Hawaii and does it. I didn't realize that they actually get people locally that have the skills to assist. Yeah, it goes a lot of different ways. There are, you know, some productions that fly in their own team and and some that use us or other local teams. So it just depends on what they want to do. But for us, it's been a process over the last five years. Um, I started 
interning at Sky's the Limit under Kella as a Grom, you know, just interned there for a year and then got on salary for a year. And we were, we started doing like real estate and stuff in the beginning and with small drones and it just slowly grew and grew. And, and now, you know, with his contacts, he has lived here his whole life. He speaks fluent Hawaiian. He went to immersion school. He, you know, he has cousins across the whole place. You know, he's got connections. Yeah. And he's really good. Like he's a charismatic guy. He's really personable and you want to be his friend from the moment that you start talking to him. And so he's just a networking master. So that's your first hurdle, you know, just getting your foot in the door, being having facial recognition with the people that you need to. They mm -hmm. need to see you and be like, oh, that's the guy that we need for drones, you know. And then uh, on the back end of that, there was a ton of paperwork and licensing that Kella did. He's also a, a airplane pilot. So he has that whole side of experience to bring to it. Okay. Be, you know, drones were freaking people out. It was freaking the FAA out and everything in the beginning. You know, it was, it was a whole hassle. Everything has calmed down now, but we, you know, he has a great relationship with the permitting office here. He can, you know, call in a permit last minute and they know it's Kella. And Kel is going to do it properly and safely, and they approve the permits. You know, that's wow. a big one. Big productions, they don't do anything, you know, without a permit. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. And so we, we have that streamlined. Um, and then as far as the equipment, the equipment is super expensive. So you need to have, you know, someone to back you to, to front the, the cost of that equipment. And that happened in the early days. And um, now we have a, you know, a relationship with FreeFly Systems. And for Aquaman 2, they, they sent a technician with a new drone, their newest drone and their newest batteries and their newest gimbal all over to be a part of that production because it was you know, a big deal to have their equipment on Aquaman 2. And so we, you know, we flew over like a few days before the production. We go over to Kella's house and we run through everything. We're there like 12, 14-hour days just doing technical stuff, just, you know, nerding out on the gimbals and the cables. And they, the production gave us a red with a certain lens and a certain package that we need to make work for this drone. Okay. And that happens every time. New camera, new lens, whatever. You got to figure it out. So you've got focus motors and iris motors, and it's a whole process. But for us to get on to any production, they have to contact us through contacts that they have. And... It just takes time to get yourself established, you know, as the drone guys for Hawaii or, or whatever, wherever you are. It just takes time. So like Kella is connected to the, the la you know, the person that, that did Aquaman 2 and that person at Aquaman 2 might refer the next, uh, you know, uh, film or whatever that wants to be done in Hawaii and say, oh, you just have to contact Kella. He'll take care of everything when it comes to drone footage. And the next thing you know, you're back on set. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the producers are the same for every movie. You know, oh. there'll be at least one or two producers that are the same. Um, and so we, you know, we're very familiar with them and they're very familiar with us. And the producers are the ones who go and source all of the, the work, you know? Wow. So like for, from the point in which they contact you to the point in which you're actually filming for the movie, like what is that time limit? Sometimes it's a couple of days. Sometimes it's a month. You know, it just depends. And um, the more lead time, the better. But it also kind of, you know, kind of sucks a little bit because you don't you're not guaranteed there's weather there's um, they might be behind on shooting or ahead and they might need to change the timetable or, you know, midday, the weather, the lighting might change and they have to pause or, you know, go to a different scene or something. And it sometimes you're sitting on set for eight hours and you work for 20 minutes. You know, mm. it's it's really it's really random. But. Yeah, it, Kella, Kella does all the heavy lifting for that for that business. I'm I'm there to simply operate the camera or be the tech. You know, there's a lot of cases, there's a lot of batteries, there's a lot of things to set up and tear down every time. You know, video transmission equipment, all that. So, yeah. So so in that case, then you actually would work for Kella's company, um, and then when the project comes up, he just reaches out to you and says, "Hey, this project's coming up. I'm gonna need you to handle X, Y, and Z." Or Yep. Like that. Yep. He handles everything like wow. until the time where I need to show up and set up gear a few nights before uh -huh. or come over, charge gear, pack gear, whatever it is. Until that point, I don't do anything. Got it. OK. Which is awesome. awesome for me, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and and so what is um 
so what is like of, of the different films that you've worked on, which one has like really, really pushed you or challenged you when it came to the actual filming portion? Like, were you I, like, dude, this is like, I have to figure this out. Yeah. Each one has its challenges for sure. Most of them are technical with the gear. Uh huh. Um, but I'd say kind of the craziest flight we ever did was uh-huh. for Inhumans. Okay. Um, and it was a night shot. They had a, you know, a 10 K light up on a crane up in the, up in the trees, replicating moonlight. Whoa. They had huge like hoses running through the jungle that were spraying out, you know, like smoke to make it hazy. And the talent was meant to run up this Creek bed that has water in it. It's not dry without rolling their ankles. <laughs> And just full sprint up this creek bed. And our shot was coming down from about 40 feet, drop the drone down as fast as possible as the talent come into frame and then follow them up the creek. (laughs) And it was like the tightest flying and gimbal work and video. I mean, me and Kella were like hiding behind a huge leaf in the jungle, like to get the right line of sight to see what that's awesome. And it's like, it was crazy. I, I, I'm still impressed by that piloting that he did on that day, but yeah, I'm sure was... you walked away from that and you felt so good. You know, oh, I need yeah. to go home. You're like, what an adventure today. Like that was oh, awesome. Yeah. Every time we go home and we have a couple of drinks in the garage and we chill there for like three hours and talk about the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. So much to unpackage from the day. So many so puzzles. Is that, is... Is that kind of the the direction that when it comes to the commercial side work that you do that you that you that you really love and want to continue to get into is the drone the drone work or are you expanding and trying to do kind of all of the filming type stuff? Yeah, I would what I would love to do is the way I see it there's you know there's really small gigs for you know you can get a gig for 500 bucks, 1000 bucks easy, you know, shoot some products, whatever, minor but then, you, you know, you've got movies where you're showing up. It's like eight grand for the day. Like you got, you know, $250,000 worth of gear and you're like, yeah, this is big time. But what about all those productions in between? Yeah. You know, there's the $10,000 gigs, the $40,000 gigs, the $30,000 gigs. You know, the, there's so much room in there where if you just have a decently nice camera and some ND filters and. You know, you know how to use your camera really well. You got some audio equipment and you have a story to tell in two minutes, three minutes or less. Like those are those are ten or twenty thousand dollar gigs if you can take on the whole thing by yourself. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So that's kind of where I would like to go in the commercial space. The drone stuff is great. It's not consistent, you know, mm. and then like a ten thousand dollar a gig like i've done those before they're not that bad you know it's you can do that with a one or two man crew depending on what it is if you need to shoot interviews you know you definitely need another person to help you with audio and another angle Mm -hmm. if it's you know say say it's a, a fishing commercial or you know it's a local cultural commercial about a new you know a restoration of a certain area of the island you know, you need to get some audio bites of the people talking about what's going on. It's potentially a sit-down interview. You need to shoot B-roll, most likely slow motion or off-speed, as they say. Um, you're going to need to, but I, you know, you got to shoot the interview first so they talk about it and you know what shots to get. And that that's only going to be a minute, two-minute, three-minute piece. But that done at a high level with good audio and good storytelling is worth a ton of money. Yeah. And for me... Uh, and not only the money for me, but the value that it adds to the customer and the viewer on the on the back end watching that, you know, for for, for Lexus or, or whatever it is, um, it's it's totally doable. And there's a ton of it. Do you, do you find that a lot of that does come to Hawaii? Like or or are you kind of referring to like doing it pretty much anywhere, like, you know, coming to the States or or overseas somewhere else or Ideally, are you mostly locally? Yeah, ideally locally, just just for ease of um of everything else I'm doing, you know. Uh-huh. I'd l- if if it's the right project, I would definitely fly and and make it happen. But ideally, local local stuff. Um, it's a beautiful place, and I think a lot of you know brands and companies um 
can benefit from the beauty that's here. And a lot of a lot of stuff comes here. I, a lot of people that I follow on Instagram, they're always shooting commercial stuff. And yeah, I think it's uh, it'd be better for me, you know, to be close to home for sure. Okay. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about storytelling and what kind of tips you have for individuals who are trying to tell small stories for their own personal projects or for work or for marketing departments and things like that. When it comes to trying to put together a little video that's one or two, you know one or two minutes long to kind of tell a story about it could be a product it could be anything, what is your kind of tips or thinking around the steps that someone needs to take so that the story is cohesive, right? So like when I when I watch your channel, it, it seems very cohesive. You're up, you're you're having coffee, you're getting equipment, and then you're out in the water, you're catching things, and then you might have a, a shot of like what's going on or the sun coming down and then you wrap up your story and it, it always feels complete. Like, I feel like I understand what he did that day. I got enough detail. I didn't get too much detail. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so like, how do you, how do you process that? And, and, and what tips can you give to people who are trying to figure out how to do a little bit of this on their own just for their, their work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the as far as like a one or two minute, if you're you know talking commercial versus you, you commercial, I would just say learn how to interview, okay. learn how to ask questions, learn how to dig deeper, go further in the interview than you think you should because all those audio bites you don't know which ones you're going to use in the final product. Okay, just dig deep in that interview and you you'll have a way better product. I promise you. As far as like a YouTube blog like I do. Mm -hmm. I, and Jackson and I have talked about this a lot, like, and it's, it's after you do about 10 of them, you can edit the video in your head as you're shooting. Oh, really? Fully. Like oh, it, will, <laughs> it fully, you know, exactly where you at, you know, exactly how many shots you are, you know, where you are in the storyline. And, and like, if you look at like Casey Neistat said once in the video and people ask him like, dude, how do you put out a video every day? You know, when he was daily vlogging, he's like, I mean, just look at it. It's a 10 minute video and there's 24 hours in the day. Yeah. You know, so you don't have to film everything. I sometimes I only talk four or five times in a video in a, in a whole day. That's nothing. Yeah. You know, so you just, I would say just do 10 videos. Then look at those 10 videos and watch them again after you release them or, or kept them on your hard drive, whatever you want to do, and look at where the holes are. You're, you're going to wish things about each video. You're going to be like, I wish I had a slow-mo of that, or I wish I said that, or I wish I had more of that, or I wish I did a drone shot there. Learn from that, and then in your next one, you're going to see that potential hole coming in your video. You're going to be like, oh, this is a really beautiful location. I just talked about what I was going to do. I could put a song and then go to into a little... 30 second beauty reel right here. You know, you're going to edit that in your head as you go. It's just going to come naturally. I see. And do you, do you take into consideration what let's say friends and family say after your, your videos are posted? Yeah, I do. Okay. I do. Um, and everyone has said the fishing one's my favorite, <laughs> just like you did. So yeah. I'm like, Oh, okay, fine. More fishing, not no surfing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no. So I actually love the surfing ones as well. It's just, I'd never seen anyone fish on a jet ski before. So I was like, wow, this is super interesting. And I kept looking at your video and wondering like when you were turning it to see how you mounted your poles and stuff. Cause I, oh, was, yeah. I, I, I just kept thinking like, so do you troll with it? You know what I mean? And then yeah. it just catches the fish on its own or like what, what made it interesting to me was that I had more questions. Oh, and, that's then cool. you, and then you kept doing more videos on it and I kept getting my questions answered. And so yeah. a lot of I, I, you being a creative person and I think a very rising star, in my opinion, I, I love the stuff that you do. I feel like for you, it maybe comes off a little bit more natural, where for some of us who don't actually work in that area, it it's almost like we're looking for a um, almost like we're looking for an outline. Right. Where we're like, OK, I have to write down, do this shot first, do this shot second. Right. When you said like, oh, I'm already telling the story in my head the whole time. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to make this slow moment to do this. I'm going to do that. It doesn't feel natural for us as much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do, it, do you know what I mean? It's a process. Um, and 
I will tell you or, or anyone listening the same exact thing. If you were to go on YouTube and type in how to start blogging or how to make videos, they're all going to say the exact same thing. Just start. Yeah. Just go make one. You're going to learn so much in your first five, ten videos that you never would have. You couldn't learn from pre-planning you know, and thinking about it. Just like, like, do you shoot. think that you would you would feel the same about your process if you had decided that you wanted to do a one hour feature? A one hour feature scares me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like. Okay. <laughs> is it the same? I have the same feeling about making a one hour feature as I do about writing a four hundred page book. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, dude, it's so intimidating. But from what I've gathered, it's it's multiple storylines told in a different way, just sequenced together. Okay. So, you know, you, and you have three acts in every movie or every video, you got the beginning, the middle and the end. And you, in the beginning, you need to, at the end of your first act, you need to introduce the problem or the activity or Mm -hmm. whatever it is in the middle, you got to show it and then you got to resolve it in the end. You know, you got to finish that thing off. So it's, but a one hour version of that really scares me. Yeah, I mean, like I was watching um, the season one of, uh, oh my gosh, on Red Bull. Sorry, I'm drawing, drawing a blank right now. Uh, oh, Kai Lenny's, I think it's Hi- oh, Life, yeah. of, Life Kai. of Kai. Life of Kai. Yeah. And, I, and I was looking at how each episode was kind of cut and kind of put together. And I, th- I mean, you're right. Like e- even at the macro level, each episode seemed to be a mini right? Yeah. Each one tells a different story. And then within that 45 minutes, there's like three stories within the 45 minute story. Yeah. Right. And it's really, if you can just come up with those, each main points that you want to make and then blend them and transition them smoothly, you have a feature. That's awesome. Yeah. No, yeah. this has been, this has been great. Um, before I let you go, cause I don't want to take up too much of your time here. Um, I had written down some questions that people had, um, that, uh, they wanted to ask you. And I was hoping that you wouldn't mind um, answering them. Um, yeah, and so the first one was, were you born in Hawaii? And have you lived there your whole life? I was born in Hawaii at Castle Hospital. And I moved from Hawaii when I was like three months old. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and I've always kind of been a little bit salty about that fact. Like, Mom, <laughs> Dad, like, come on, like could have grown up with bleach blonde hair and ripping surfing you know but you know it's they were young parents not super young i think 24 or 23 and uh-huh. and it was just too, it's too expensive here yeah it's oh, a it struggle is. Sure, here yeah. to raise a kid or or anything it's it's nuts so but your parents moved. are there now though right so you, you yeah it's a miracle it's oh. <laughs> the best thing ever <laughs> we we moved to michigan moved into my mom's parents place for a while and then we got a motor home we motor homed around the country for a while kind of hippie vibes honestly when i look back at the vid, at the old pictures i'm like well, we were kind of kind of nomads a little bit <laughs> they're like yeah we were and then we kind of settled in uh in california for a while northern california and then moved to washington state did high school in washington state and then after my freshman year of college in washington my dad and mom got jobs at a school here on oahu and my life completely changed are they, do they teach or? They used that... to. Yeah. They, oh, okay. We moved here in 2011 and they, and they, my dad was a principal. My mom was the Dean of the dorm. It was a small private a- academy. And uh, yeah, we, they did that for seven or eight years, seven years. And, and now they do completely different stuff here. Awesome, man. That's what an adventure. So where did you live in Northern California? Just curious. Cause that's where I live right now. Oh, really? I was um, in Angwin. Um, kind of up the hill from Napa Valley. From Napa Valley, yeah, in Sonoma County area, yep. right? Yep. Yeah, oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm out in San Mateo, so I'm like not far from Mavericks over in Half Moon Bay. Oh, nice. That's if you're familiar awesome. with, yeah, with that, obviously. Yeah, I have obviously. been to Half Moon Bay. That is a crazy place. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fun one. I love it. I'm pretty much there every other weekend, so it's, it awesome. feel, feel, feels good. Um, the other question that we had here, let me see, was where you live in... Uh, did you grow up in Hawaii? Oh, if someone were to decide that they wanted to move to Hawaii, um, you have the the north side, the uh, the north side, the south side, the east side, and the west side. Could you kind of summarize what the difference is between those areas? And if you were to be moving from somewhere like California to Hawaii, where would you live? Yeah, um, they're all very different. 
a west side you've got much more of a local community um very nice beaches a lot drier over there long commute to town so okay. that's kind of the west side really good surf um you know much more localized than a lot of other parts of the island so if you can if you're really good at assimilating into a new community go for it that you okay. can totally pull that off but don't go there with too much arrogance because it will get shut down pretty quickly <laughs> and there's a lot of car theft out there people breaking your cars um and, and take your camera gear that's happened to me twice okay so south side um you've got you know honolulu you got town you got you know everything nightlife big buildings that whole thing lots of good surf a lot of longboarding waves you know in the summer there's bigger waves really nice town is town is really nice you kind of got the mix you've got you got city life and within 15 minutes you can be in the jungle you know really cool uh, the east side is the best side. <laughs> okay, okay. That's where I live now with my girlfriend. We live in Kaneohe on the east side of Oahu, and it is absolutely beautiful. You kind of have this this backdrop of really dramatic mountains, um, and spin 180 and look at the ocean, and it's just the most beautiful bay with a sandbar in the middle of it, and it's just so beautiful, and it's kind of the most untapped kind of side of the island as far as like surf potential um uh -huh. there it's it's the windy side so you've got 15 20 knot winds a lot of the year on this side so it's um a lot of choppy surf sometimes but it's good and then the north shore of course um you're gonna have if you live past Haleiwa, like deep in the north shore mm -hmm. you're gonna have a long commute if you got work on the south side or wherever but you've okay. got pipeline you've got all the classic epic waves sunset you know Haleiwa, all the big waves you've got the boat harbor you've got great you know you've got basically two options for groceries you know it's more country living um more definite beach life you know you're going to see a lot of really good surfers so it's just like if you want to be a part of the action in in surf sports you live up there for sure but so yeah. does living in the North shore though, mean that like, if you need a hospital or anything like that, that you have to go to the South shore in order to get that, or do they have all that stuff available on the North shore? I think the closest hospital might be the beginning of the East side or maybe on your way to the South shore, Wahiwa. It's kind of far. I mean, yeah, 30 minutes. Okay. So you really are minutes. pretty, I'm, you're pretty far. I mean, when they say country, it really is kind of country. It's very quiet compared to being in town, you know, where yeah. things are bustling and busy. Slower, you know, slower speed limits, one road. Um, in the winter time, it's bustling with surfers and people. In the summer, it's just dead quiet, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, there's just no waves whatsoever. And, and it, it changes a lot every season. Okay. Yeah. And then the last question that I had on here was, is Hawaii really as expensive as everyone says it is? Or meaning like once you're living there and you're embedded in it, is it just like living in California or anywhere else? Or is it significantly more expensive like we kind of hear about from a distance? It's expensive. Yeah. But I mean, and it, it's it depending on what stage of life, you know, you're in, if, if you came here as a college student or you're taking a semester off like that's going to be tough um to fully experience the island and pay for everything and rent and all that that's gonna be super tough unless you have like five roommates okay um okay. if you came later in life you know you have an established business or you're retired or whatever it is and you've got you know your income is solid and you you can afford housing and and, and all that you'll be fine it's fine it's i mean i'm I'm a freelance content creator who isn't viral and I can afford to live here. I do have tricks and trade of that. You know, you got to <laughs> have a Costco card and you, Oh yeah. You want to, you know, try and find all the gas rewards you can and, you know, go shop where it's cheaper and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, you, you get used to it. It's, once you accept the prices, it's just like, oh, I just got to make it happen. Do, do you personally get kind of island fever at all? Meaning like where you kind of feel like you want to leave and go explore other areas, like whether it be to you know come to California or other places like that for a period of time? Or do you feel really kind of connected with the community to the point where you don't really feel that way? Yeah, fully. I mean, it's about every three months you get the itch. 
Um, but that itch can be easily supplemented by going to a neighboring island, 20 minute flight. Oh, know? true. And yeah. what it is, is that I feel the need to appreciate what I have. And once you, you, know, you, you get used to it, you don't appreciate it as much. And I hate that. I know, but you right? can't avoid it. It's not possible unless you make changes. So yeah. recently I just went to Kauai for five days. Um, me and Lima bought plane tickets for my birthday. So that was super awesome. So we went over there and we did it on the cheap. We stayed at her grandma's place. Her grandma let us use her car. Like, dude, we barely paid a thing for this trip and came back to Oahu all juiced, all appreciative again. And that's what you need to do. That's, that's, that's awesome. And so yeah. she's, she's from Hawaii as well. Yeah. She's a, yeah. Oh, okay. That's awesome. So she, and having her grandma on another island, that's pretty rad because then you guys can visit whenever you want. Yeah. She's got a ton of family over there. And um, yeah, she, she was born and raised here and much more embedded in the community than I am. Oh, <laughs> it's cool to tag along on some of that, you know? Oh, I would so imagine. There's, yeah. There's a lot to be learned and there's places and situations I get to be in that I wouldn't ever be in. Yeah. Well, Justin, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, our, our listeners loved all the stories you told last time, and I'm sure they're going to love all these stories. And I'd love for you to be able to tell people how to get a hold of you if they'd like to talk to you about some commercial work or um, if they just want to maybe ask you questions and stuff and become fans of your of your of your channel. So um, do you mind telling everybody how to get a hold of you and the best way to contact you? Yeah, no worries. Um, probably the best would be through Instagram. Um, my my handle is justin.g with two S's. Send me a DM. My email is also linked on that profile as well. Feel free to send me an email and we can go from there. But yeah, stoked that everybody likes listening and go drop a comment on the YouTube channel. If, if you have any other further questions, I, I read pretty much all of the comments and I try to respond to the the real questions, you know, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, and feel free to, to come back anytime you want, anytime you want to talk about anything, maybe after your project launches with, uh, uh, with the other TV channel, what was it called again? Uh, stream Moku. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Stream um, Moku. Feel free to, Big co- things. Oh, oh, Moku. Yep. Yeah. As, as those things unfold, feel free to reach out to me if you want to come back. And, um, I know we started kind of building a little friendship here, texting back and and forth and and we love having you and stuff. So thanks everyone so much for taking the time to listen today. We really appreciate it. We'll be posting links to many of the sources that we referenced on Twitter. So you can find us and follow us at the X podcast one. That's the X podcast. Number one, if you liked this podcast, found it interesting or informative, it helps us a great deal. If you subscribe and leave a review on whatever platform you use, thank you all. And we will see you all next week.